So these are my disclosures. And the first question is, what do we think treatment will look like in five or 10 years? Will this indeed be single tablet regimens, which have very few limitations on how and when we take them, uh, that have three drugs, and that's what we'll be doing? Will we have quite a bit of two drug regimens, which will also be part of our mainstream practice, or will we actually be giving long acting formulations and look back sort of smiling at the days where patients had to take one pill every day. And what about the differences? It's amazing that there are such differences today in our care. In Europe, if you're in Switzerland or the Ukraine, are you receiving the same drugs? And what about the states? If you live in Beverly Hills or rural Alabama, is the medicine different? Why are we receiving different drugs? And will this continue? or will we put an end to it? And what about pediatrics? For those of us who consult with pediatrics, it's amazing all the somersaults you sometimes have to do with a pediatric patient, thinking if this patient were an adult, we would have different drugs uh, to give them. And you know, what will happen today in the same city, you might have you know, drug reps talking and saying, well, Dr. X likes Daglutegravir, but Dr. Y prefers Bictegravir. So this may be rational, it may be that it's the same for statins, or maybe in the future, it'll be more like strep throat, where we say, this is what you give for this, uh, for, for this condition. So will it depend in the future on which country, which city, which doctor to know what a patient will be given, or will we have unified what's best for our patients? And of course, monitoring as well. So is, is there going to be a situation where really, you know, you go to a clinic and whoever the boss is, whatever she or he wants, that's how you monitor your patient? Or will there be a data-driven, best optimal routine monitoring, which maybe we will adjust a little bit based on the patient? And who will be doing the monitoring? Will it be an MD? Or will it be another healthcare professional, perhaps a nurse, or maybe even someone who didn't train as a nurse can monitor. And if we look at some of the recent data, will this be done even at the clinic? Or will we have on our smartphone an app where the vast majority of the data is actually entered by the patient and then it's reviewed by someone, everything's fine, we continue. How, how will this work, especially if we'll be treating 30, 40 uh, million people? So what will it include? So first of all, our Mainstream is viral load testing, but how often? And today, how much is this actually data-driven, how often we, we, we monitor? And should this be very much dependent on the duration of successful treatment? Do we monitor the, the same the first year and the fifth year, or Carlo's patient who's 16 years is undetectable, should we change that? What, what's correct? Uh, what about inflammation markers? Will we finally have a good biomarker or biomarkers which we'll be monitoring regularly and have been validated? Renal, bone, neuromonitoring, will that be needed and how will we do it? And perhaps going back to my first slide, what will this depend on? Will this depend on our regimens? Will it be different how and how frequently we monitor patients based on if we're giving three drugs, two drugs, or a long-acting preparation? Will these dictate what we monitor and how frequently? So, if I would ask you today, uh, where would you check HIV RNA more frequently, with a three-drug regimen or with a two-drug regimen? You can think to yourself, if today I have a patient on three drugs or two drugs, where would you more frequently want to monitor your drug? And if you say I'm more comfortable actually with a three-drug regimen, then the second question, I think this is really our burden as clinicians, is what data and how much data do you want to see in order to change your mind? So if today you're more comfortable with three than two, what do you want to see? What do you want to see from clinical research or laboratory research to change your mind and say, you know what? I feel two and three are the same today. I think it's important that we as clinicians drive this and not only the folks uh, who are necessarily doing this so we can say this is what we need in order to change uh, how we consider two versus three drugs. So when you think of the resistance consequences uh, of some of this, and of course, Carlo gave us this broad overview looking at, of course, the, the long dimension of this when we'll be treating patients for decades. So when do you think you will see a first mutation appear earlier? 
with dolgotegavir 3TC, dolgotegavir piverine, or bictegavir uh, and FTAF? Where will you first see a mutation? And will this have widespread clinical impact? And that is a question. So will this difference be a few months? Will it be a few years? And if you magnify it by large populations for long times, is it really that different? Does it have a clinical difference? Or is this something which will be a, a nuance? But let me also ask you, what are the consequences of a long-term failure with each of these regimens? So if you're on one of these regimens and you're not well monitored and you go you know, for years or for a long time and you know, theoretically you fail all the drugs, where would you do more damage? So these are sort of the mutations you could ultimately see. And you could hypothesize that if you indeed eventually select for resistance to all, you could have situations where a three-drug regimen would actually result in losing more drugs. For example, here, you would get the K65R and no longer be able to use drugs like Tenofovir or TAF if you actually had the three-drug regimen. So in some cases, you could say that a two-drug regimen uh, would prevent future op uh, options, but the mutations may accumulate more slowly with the three. So there's sort of a, a trade-off here. We're saying, well, on the one hand, we might see them earlier with two, but ultimately, if we see patients failing for a long time, then we would be uh, more concerned with three. And here, I think, we're, we need to start looking at data. It, are these subtle changes? Are these subtle differences? Or are they major differences? So if you say mutations may accumulate more slowly, and you're actually saying so slowly that they virtually never appear, then to some degree, the first question also becomes moot. So if you're basically on a 2NRTI, second gen generation integrase, almost never will see resistance, then it doesn't matter that theoretically you could get three. So if this pattern, if 184, 65, and integrase mutations is almost never going to be seen, it's different than if we see it, but less. And here I think we as clinicians here we have to think sort of, you know, what data do we need now to see? Because there's a difference between, you know, th things being 3 or 5 percent or being 0.1 versus 5 percent. So data we have so far is pretty compelling for 2NRTIs uh, plus a second generation integrase inhibitor. And I'm talking primarily about dilutegravir and bictegravir, although cabotegravir I think is also in that class, um, not yet an approved drug. So in all the large, the large studies of dilutegravir versus efavirenz or alteglavir, and a moderately large study versus darunavir, we all know these data, and none of these did we see mutations to integrase at all. Not to, you know, not to talk about all three drugs, we didn't see it. And we now have a also very large development program for bictegravir, large, big studies, where the comparator arm is also good because it also was two nukes with a second generation. So all these patients, what are this, uh, 1,200 patients are looking exactly at the regimen we want to see. Two nukes and a second generation integrase. The naive studies, when they looked at patients failing, there weren't a lot, no resistance integrase. And there were also switch studies where they took patients who were suppressed and put them again on 2NERTIs and integrase inhibitor, did well, and once again, no resistance. The only one resistance uh, within a PI switch. So basically, we have, I think, a large body of evidence. True, I think, going back to what Carlo says, it's not 10 years. These are relatively small follow-ups for patients who will be taking these for a few decades, but lots of patients and actually two different drugs and even two different backbones. And so far, if we were to ask how commonly are we going to see that combination, it's not very common. In fact, it might be one of those almost never. And therefore, when we start thinking of this trade-off of you know, preserving options, is that an option which we have to worry about? And I think this is a consideration for us, you know, what data and how much data? So I think today, when we sort of think about you know, our three versus two drug options, for the three drug options, which include the two nukes with either bictegavir, dilutegavir, I think right now our current data, and again, with the caveat that it's not five or 10 year data, but these are data now of a number of years, the current data suggests that even with widespread long-term use, resistance may hopefully not be a significant challenge 
at the individual or patient population if that's the regimen you're giving and we're concerned about integrase toxicity. For our two drug regimens, we don't know yet. And we're all eagerly awaiting data. Obviously, we sit at this meeting, we see one patient here, one patient there. We've learned you know, that the, the plural of, ante, of anecdotes is not data. Data is good large studies, and those will be coming soon. But even maybe before we see these studies, we should say to ourselves and ask ourselves, OK, what do we have to see for these two drug regimens to convince us that they are similar to three drug regimens or close enough for us to be happy. And I think that's a question that's good that we think about before we start seeing the data coming out because it's ultimately gonna be uh, our decision as clinicians. And lastly, when we think about these two versus three, how are they gonna impact some of these other factors? And we, I think we could discuss this a lot. But will they impact inflammation markers differently, inflammation differently? You know, we still don't have a good handle on this. We know it's bad. And we know we wanna change it, uh, if we have good markers, this will be something uh, we'll want to look at. Renal, bone, contravascular toxicity, we have to hone in on this because this is what's beginning to kill our patients and to what degree will, be, will they be differences. Neuro, there's always a flip-flop, at least in my mind. On the one hand, I want the drugs to all get into the CNS and crush the virus, but I don't like drugs in the CNS because they give us toxicity. And we're always sort of flip-flopping on this. So I think as our patients age and as we're aware that acutely neurotoxicity and neuro damage from HIV is an issue, we sort of have to balance. I think that's something I would love more focus on on three versus two drugs. CNS toxicity, but also CNS suppression of the virus. And again, this is something which maybe we need to spend uh, more time on. And of course, the reservoir and lots of experts here in the room. How do we look at this? How do we study it? How do we nest this into studies of two versus three drugs so we start getting uh, good data. And of course, we as clinicians have to decide how much data we want to see, what data we want to see, so we'll be able to make smart decisions in the future if we'll want to use three drugs or two drugs or perhaps these long actings. And I'll stop there. Thank you.